given the many time zones we're in, I'll just say good day to everyone. And about halfway through the presentation, I think you also have an idea what this uh, piece of modern art on my first slide is. Um, I do want to give a little bit of a motivation, though, why software is important. Um, first, maybe very generally, um, this plot here shows you on the x-axis time, and uh, on the y-axis, the relative peak brilliance um, of modern light sources, x-ray light sources, and the number of transistors and processors, so commonly known as Moore's Law. And um, the y-axis here is logarithmic, so this is actually both exponential, and uh, you can see they're the coupling a bit. And if we now kind of naively assume a bit that every photon we generate here could be a useful point of data we want to process, um, you see where this is going. Just throwing more hardware at the solution might, throw, throwing more hardware at the problem might not be a solution really anymore. Um, so specifically for the European Expo, if we stay with a data perspective, um, we've produced so far around 100 petabytes of data. That's um, 100,000 terabytes. That's um, quite a lot. And maybe a good unit to visualize that is actually USB hard drives, which nowadays frequently come one terabyte in size and are about a centimeter tall. So if you stack these things up to reach 100 petabyte, you have a one kilometer high tower. That's a lot of data. And processing this data, acquiring this data, software is needed to make that happen. Um, for us specifically at the facility, this means our software can produce up to five petabytes of data per week. Luckily, the instruments, which Chris just showed, don't regularly do all that much. Otherwise, we might run out of hard disk space. Um, we can also run our software on, on a large computing cluster, actually, at DAISY, um, with up to 10,000 cores and hundreds of GPUs. Um, so given these numbers, and uh, now I'm going to switch a bit over to sustainable software engineering, can actually make a difference in the facility's environmental footprint. Not to mention here that better software usually also gives better scientific advances in the fields Chris mentioned, like biophysics, like material science. Um, so when I say software, what does this mean for a facility like the European Exo? Well, you've got maybe at the basics, the control software firmware, things which control your detectors, your vacuum components, all that. Then you want to somehow acquire the data you're measuring. So you have data acquisition software. You need to process that data. So idly at some point you get a figure which you can put in a report or publish in a paper or put on the web. And you have procedures which coordinate all that so a human doesn't have to click too many buttons. Um, if we look at the European Expo code repositories alone, we definitely have more than 400,000 lines of code in there, which is an active use and being maintained. Um, you can also see that in the fact that at the facility, there's approximately 50 people out of 450 staff in total who are specifically tasked with writing software, um, some of which, for instance, in the group I lead. Okay, now one more definition, and then we go on to a few examples. What is sustainable software? So disclaimer here, I am not an expert on sustainable software engineering, but I can read um, definitions on the internet and then compare them about against our software, um, which actually is quite a nice exercise to do. But generally, sustainable software should be efficient. That's maybe kind of obvious. And also make efficient use of hardware. So you don't need the supercomputing cluster to read or write an email. Um, sustainable software should prolong the useful lifetime of existing hardware. So it should not only need cutting edge hardware. That's, by the way, very expensive as well. Um, to be exact here for European Expo, the useful lifetime for really production hardware, so where we take measurements is usually kind of limited a bit by the warranty, which is three years, but we then don't just throw that away, but we use it for less critical items afterwards. And finally, it should be efficient on the network and in terms of storage, um, so you don't send unnecessary data out. So these definitions I took from Microsoft. Um, I'll add one of my own. Um, it should also be sustainable for humans to use and develop and maintain. Uh, a little bit more on that later. Good. Um, let's show some examples. One here at the facility, which is developed in the controls group, is our in-house distributed control system. It's called Calabo. And you see on the sketch a bit on the right what a distributed control, control system can look like. Um, for us, it's a message-based system working on a so-called central message broker. That's that purple thing here in the middle, always shown as a cylinder. Um, and that basically receives messages from different components in the environment and dispatches them to where they need to go. So if a camera wants to talk to a logger, it will take care of that. For really big data, you don't usually want to use such a broker. For that, we have 
high bandwidth point-to-point -point connections. So camera talking to some image analysis maybe. Importantly, we use that system for remote control and monitoring of the equipment at the facility. Um, or in another word, it keeps humans out of the x-rays way, um, so out of the hutches and makes the experiments running um, and manageable. Um, one additional feature of Kalalu is it's event-driven. And you see that at the plot here on the right of the sketch. A um, more traditional system would pull this data. So maybe once a second, it would take a measurement. An event-driven system really only sends data out when the value significantly changes, so the orange points here. Um, so what scope is that about? Well, a European XFOL, that control system contains about two and a half million control parameters. And now we're at this modern piece of art. This is actually a rendering of the control system topology of our MID instrument. So the points here are pluggable software components. The lines are their interconnections, things that talk over this message broker, and the colors represent different application classes of the software. So this is actually highly complex. And through the remainder of the talk, I want to motivate, amongst other things, a bit that interdisciplinary teams help us manage this complexity. Um, the next slide highlights a bit more what's actually going on the network, but it's a bit of a flashy video. So if you have this comfort with flashing videos, I'll tell you when it's over and you might not want to view this one. But for those who do, here's um, what I call Kalabu Broker Pong. So on the left side, you have things sending data on the right side, the receivers, and this is in real time. Okay, this is recorded, but actually time flow is as in real time. And you already see that's quite a lot. Um, if now we had a polling system and everything just sends up once every second, um, you're at even more. So if we now check Caribou against our sustainability um, checklist, um, I guess somewhat on accident where we actually developed a quite uh, sustainable system there. Um, so the data is only sent over the network when it actually changed because it's event driven. So that's quite efficient on network and storage actually. Um, turns out the system was also highly scalable. It can run on hardware as small as a Raspberry Pi or in systems with tens of course, and we're doing both. And it's also within the limits, which you of course need to maintain, able of saturating either of these systems. So it really maximizes usage of available hardware and can also run on older hardware. Uh, the system itself is extendable. So you can add more pluggable software components to a core system. So it can also accommodate new requirements and grow as you need it. And then the user interface is actually, um, our scientists can quite easily adapt without needing encoding. So that's also that's on the sustainable side for humans. Um, we've early on seen Anna, who um, works in the group actually on coding GUIs as well, which can be more specific then, but it, uh, it offers both solutions. Um, Calb is also well tested. On the right side, you see Anya, who's our dedicated test engineer. And this is really important. Um, the machine and the instruments Chris showed you earlier, um, they consume a lot of energy on their own. For the accelerator, which is cryogenic, superconducting, we're talking decent town actually in terms of energy consumption. So if this is running and a piece of software fails at the other end, you can't actually record any data, this might all go to waste. So um, Anya, for instance, here has more than 6,000 test cases she runs through at every release um, to make our software uh, reliable and stable. And uh, one additional thing we do there is we actually follow coding standards and have a mandatory code review process, which makes our code maintainable. Um, so who does all that? Okay, you've already seen Anya. Here's the rest of the group. Um, we're pretty interdisciplinary and also diverse in where we come from. So we have colleagues from 11 different countries. These little symbols show a bit on the background, um, which is anywhere from software engineering to uh, nuclear physics. Um, I'd say we also have a strong cultural diversity um, given the number of countries. However, as you can also see from the picture, uh, we should be honest that gender diversity um, can still be approved and um, what uh, Monica and Mata said there earlier on in the interviews, I think it's really important to start early here. So high school and university to show young people that a profession in software engineering at a facility like ours can be both interesting and also achievable. Um, because of our cultural diversity, we also chose to adopt the Google style guide to avoid marginalizing language in our code and our documentation. Um, one important aspect of working together in such an interdisciplinary term is what I've mentioned before is code review. You see a screenshot there from uh, what is a tool called GitLab, that's a web tool, where we have discussions on how code has changed and no code can go into the reference um, 
code database without such a discussion happening. And that's actually quite a lot of things being there discussed. So I pulled out a number of words and comments from 2022, with, which is about 350,000. And if you look into works of classical literature, um, we're somewhere between Mo Moby Dick and Ulysses there in terms of words written and comments there. Good. Um, another example where software can help in terms of sustainability, um, that is um, predictive maintenance. Um, so if you look at the plot on the lower right here, uh, which is an arbitrary sketch of some data coming in, in our time series database. And uh, what we're aiming here is to predict future trends and maybe identify that something might fail or an issue might occur. If you get that early on, you could in the best maintain hardware, for instance, before it fails, or at least um, swap it out before it fails during operation. Again, think of the accelerator and everything. This all draws a lot of power, um, so let's make use of it. The effort here is mainly in the data analysis group, and that's Anna and Danilo, you see on the top right. We're working on models and methods to analyze the data relevant for our control and vacuum systems. Um, my final example in terms of software, actually, is detector calibration, um, which I actually kind of started off with at the facility. And um, maybe you saw that LPD detector in Chris's slides from, from the FXE instrument. So, that's the one of a kind detector with very high data rates. We're talking 20 gigabytes per second. And the images you get out of it, well, you can distinguish something in this raw image, but you actually need to do calibration corrections first to get the most out of it and do actual science. And this is our main data product. So doing this successfully really critically impacts the quality and uh, of the data and the science we do at the facility. If we look into that a bit more detail, we get this sketch. That's how the thing is set up. You see the detector again here on the top left. And then this goes on a bunch of huge hard disks. And um, then there's basically two ways for the data to go on. One is what we call offline processing. Uh, that's that huge um, computing cluster. Or to online processing where you want low latency um, and actually see what you're doing. And you need for both, you need this calibration database to provide calibration constants and then appropriately uh, correct the data. This online processing, by the way, will be um, important, the low latency for a final example I give. Um, now, if we look at the team doing this, uh, which consists of uh, basically three different groups here. Um, so we have data analysis, IT, data management, and detector represented. We really need experts on the scientific and engineering domain. We need detector scientists who know how these detectors behave, what is appropriate to do in calibration, how the algorithm should generally look like. And then we need software experts and IT experts who can handle the high data throughput to write um, algorithms which can actually do these operations at uh, 20 gigabytes per second. Okay, one more example, and this one's away from actual coding, but also a very good example of interdisciplinarity and agility. And that's um, the support model we have for the data department where the groups I've mentioned before are all in. And that's what we call the data operation center, the DOC. And uh, this center really gives support for the control system, data processing, detectors, data analysis, data persistence, all these kind of issues. And um, there's, two department members um, on shift there. Um, and they're from two different groups by design. They should also be from two different groups. So we have um, interdisciplinary expertise, but nobody is an expert on everything. So we also have second level on-call experts who, who back them up. Um, and as I said, by design, this is an interdisciplinary effort and it's created and sustained through agile methods. And maybe to highlight this a bit, um, this is an incident I was involved in myself. Um, I call it the mystery of the broken fiber. So here we're again talking one of these large um, bespoke detectors for the facility, uh, which is critical for the SPB instrument. It's their main detector. And I wanna draw your attention a bit on that um, small plot here in the center. Things should look like how they see look like on the right side of this plot. Um, the x-axis here again is time. We're looking at our time series database and the y-axis is latency in seconds. And that should usually be low, well below one second. But what we observed in the data operations center was this jitter you see on the left. So we call the instrument, iterate the settings, there's nothing apparently wrong. Um, so that's where we really start monitoring it. At first it went on quite okay still, and, but then sometimes we, we see that writing data to disk and seeing what is happening has become mutually exclusive. And that's not so good if you have a detector which is worth millions in there and an X-ray free electron laser, which with a few shots can burn through that detector. Um, so we start calling second level support experts. And at some point we actually have IP ITCs 
that there's a bottleneck in the network. And it turns out this was a broken fiber. And then somebody went into a server room, unplugged that fiber and the network automatically reconfigured itself and avoided the issue. So that's a really good example of an interdisciplinary solution to a highly complex pro uh, problem, which occurred, I think, within one and a half hours of, of it occurring, uh, so quite quickly. Good. So I'm not yet fully done, but I have a conclusion so far because it seems like interdisciplinary groups do kind of excel at creating scalable, scalable and high quality software in scientific research contents like ours. And um, maybe one can facilitate such groups a bit. And one way of fostering this is uh, agile development in my view. Um, so in software development, you have established agile approaches such as Scrum or Kanban, which contrast with waterfall models. Agile, much decision is left up to the team. You have rapid increments, feedback cycles, um, as you see in this sketch. And um, you basically try to deploy something um, in rapid succession and get feedback. Waterfall, most design decisions are taken beforehand and documented, and then the team really literally works through as like a waterfall of tasks sequentially, as you see at the bottom. Um, if we give a bit more detail to that or the benefits, so Agile idly empowers the team to out of the box thinking and encourages testing of ideas. It's another sketch. If you translate that somebody seeing a steam locomotive and somebody else pointing at a rocket into software, that's basically somebody pointing out, hey, maybe somebody already did this um, from the community and maybe we should be using that instead of reinventing a square wheel. Um, and you have the rapid feedback cycles, um, uh, which, which give feedback into the system. Waterfall, you might be tempted that that leads to more consistent design, but frequently it actually also yields consistent anti-patterns or even the dead end, a bicycle with square wheels, for instance. Also, by the time something has gone through the whole chain, it might be outdated. Um, now, um, waterfall can be the right choice for certain scenarios, like if we're talking safety, for instance, but Agile kind of lends itself well to our environment. Um, in Agile, if we got something wrong, we know after a month, hopefully, when showing it to the scientists, if we got it wrong with Waterfall, we might have put a year effort in it. Um, at Exfil, we basically use a variety of these processes. Frequently nowadays in the control script, it's Kanban. You see the Kanban board from uh, one of our teams here on the right. Um, What's important here are that the tasks are small, they need a definition of done, and in principle, any team member is entitled to take tasks. Think again, interdisciplinary people learn while doing this. Teams might also change from sprint to sprint, so these are increments of maybe two to four weeks, um, which facilitates exchange and new views on the problem. And finally, the feedback rounds include other shareholders, like our instrument scientists, which reduce the risk of confirmation bias, where you really think this is awesome, what you just developed in terms of software, and then you give it to the customer. And they're like, well, that's not what we asked for. Um, and this feedback happens more often. So um, does staff appreciate that? Um, this is my, my last slide before the summary. Uh, we did a survey of people in the data operations center. And I won't go through all of it, but the central three are important. Um, the further bars to the right, the better or more approval of uh, this said. And we asked people if they learned new things and if it improved communication, and that actually happens. So this is one way of developing staff, actually. In summary, um, seems like interdisciplinary groups really excel at creating scalable and high quality software. Um, and if we use modern technologies and concepts, um, uh, they might even be sustainable. Um, we should, of course, keep in mind that facilities like European Expo generally have quite a high environmental footprint. And uh, what I didn't mention in detail, much of the software we develop at the facility builds on community established libraries and tools. So uh, the use case might be Expo specific, but how we get there often is not. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So I was actually going to ask you something that you, you just mentioned. So all the all the uh, control software that is developed here at Excel is, is not specific. So the, the knowledge can be transferred if, if you know if the uh, uh, engineers or scientists go elsewhere or, or the scientists. Um, well, I think some some of the end software products might be very specific to what we need. But the way of getting there, the building blocks they build on, there we use many community provided tools like the time series database I mentioned. That is what is called InfluxDB. Um, that has wide application cases. So I think people get trained on many more fundamental technologies in the process, which can be definitely be used um, 
areas, other scientific facilities, or in industry. 